I, um, I was sent, sent your work a little while ago, actually, I think over a year ago before I started my PhD. And I was like, oh, Rodrigo's like, he's done, he's done my PhD. This is, what, <laughs> this is what, I'm, what I'm here to do. So like referencing what you've been working on over the last year has been, has been really cool. And so it's nice to actually finally sit down and talk a little bit more about it as I've dug into it, the work over the last year. And so uh, the PhD topic is on, is on real-time timbre mapping for synthesized percussion performance. And so the idea of that being able to take any acoustic percussion instrument and in real time map to a synthesized parameter space so that the performance and timbral qualities of your acoustic percussion instrument are then transferred over to the synthesized version of that. Which is, yeah, it, it's really cool. And like the, the examples you sent sound quite amazing, quite promising. And like, I, I guess like maybe rewinding a bit before that, like, are you, I guess, a drummer percussionist? Like how, how'd you end up here, I guess is? Um, I was, I was a drummer for, I always wanted to be a drummer. Uh, when I was uh, when I was a kid growing up, I like begged my parents to get me to to play drum set, and I was playing piano at the time. And I had a music teacher who was like, "Okay, if you get a snare drum and you practice your rudiments for a little while, then you know, then maybe you can progress to a drum set." And so I did that, and I played drum set sort of all through high school. Played in rock bands in high school, and simultaneously was getting a little bit more into the electronic music side of things. And so was got introduced to Ableton when I was about like 16 years ago, uh, old. And uh, I was also taking drum lessons with a really good friend, a friend of mine, Carson Gant. And I showed him that I was working on this electronic stuff. And he's like, oh, well, this is super cool. We should like start collaborating on that. And so he was a, a way better drummer than I was. And so I kind of like put the drums down and transferred over to more of the electronic production side of things. and. Uh, so had a project for quite a long time in, in Canada, in Calgary, working with Carson, where I was doing like triggering samples in Ableton and playing synths. And we would do this sort of like live, live dance music, really. And so kind of like doing live remixes, doing some kind of like live synth stuff with, with drums. have always been a very important part of my musical practice and uh, we spent a little bit of time trying to like integrate the drums more into the electronic side of things so like trying to get a some trigger set up to trigger electronic samples and it just never never really worked for us we were never able to kind of like cross that barrier barrier of having the drums inform the electronic performance more and so I think that sort of like has inspired part of this this topic is like how can we how can we get more information from a drum recording and use that to to do something in the electronic space in this synthesized space and so there's maybe a little bit more more of that acoustic um natural energy from the drums coming through into the synthesized portion of it yeah which is super 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 fascinating and overlaps a lot with what i'm interested in and like do uh, to a certain extent and like yeah it, it's it, it's a funny thing like I, i'm kind of reminded of like in, in Flucoma, one of the, the first DSB engineers we had had some kind of, he relayed an anecdote. I, this was not his comment, but that like for musicians, like like you have like military spec, like sort of algorithm tolerances and then like all these sort of increasing things. And then like musician was the fussiest because it needed to be the lowest latency, the highest quality and like all this kind of stuff. And then of that subset, I think drums or percussion is like one of the more demanding ones because the the, the latency like we don't have the comfort of masking as you might with another instrument. So like if I play a guitar note or if I sing a note, there's like a certain amount of like wiggle room perceptually where like you will still attach the note. Whereas like if you hear an attack and another attack after, like the illusion just kind of falls apart. So like mm -hmm. the, that was a big, a big one for me, like tracing that. I mean, even like everything that I'm doing in SP tools, like there's all these like micromanaging, like corner cuts as, as wherever I can just to get like, as much out of that like little tiny fragment as as possible yeah this tension between the latency between your sort of like your sound and then the action you take on it is yeah is a big one and it's like it definitely has come up time and time in my 
my research. And initially I was kind of like, I don't want to have to deal with this onset detection thing where I need to, there needs to be like this moment that something happens and then I need to do something with it. And eventually I've kind of come around where like, okay, onsets are good. I need to <laughs> do onset detection and make some decision around that. Um, but I was initially kind of like inspired by, by some of the work that's been done in continuous parameter mapping. So I think you shared some of the stuff that my colleague Franco Caspe had been doing around mapping from envelopes of parameters as sort of like continuous streams of information to other continuous streams and some of the work that's happened in this like space of differentiable digital signal processing. <laughs> Not sure if you've seen any of, of that work by with this like the timbre transfer tools that the some of the Google researchers have done. Yeah, I've, I've looked at some of that stuff, and and I think perhaps a theme kind of going through our conversation here to a certain extent is that like a lot of these concepts, like I I I kind of understand and I'm implementing some things, but I'm very much like a a musician who learns to computer a little bit. So like my like I, my I definitely don't have a CS background or is coming out of this. So a lot of the the particularly the higher order or the fancier pants um, algorithm stuff is more recent in development in terms of just being around people that are smarter than me and like, oh, that's kind of, I can use that and, and kind of implementing it and kind of learning it. But um, yeah, the the heavier machine learning side of stuff, basically stuff outside of Max gets a little harder. Although I'm obviously aware of the stuff like the, the tone transfer stuff and the magenta and all that kind of things, which I like, it's kind of interesting and, and, and maybe this is something that will kind of come up a little bit more. A lot of that stuff I always find to be an AI art in general tends to be like very lowest common denominator, uninspired stuff like, oh, what if I have a trumpet but make it sound like a saxophone? Or what if I like, how can I make my NFT shinier? Like it, it's sort of like in this domain of like, like not, not a, not a, a useful, like they don't have musicians there. Or if they do, they're not the 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 right kind of musician, you know. Like it's it's the limited imagination, like a reinventing um, like a steam engine, but like with just it's a nuclear powered steam engine instead of it just being a completely different thing, which just applying new technology to old paradigms or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's one of the things I found as I dug into that some of that differentiable digital signal processing tone transfer stuff it's like it's very it's interesting technical work and they've marketed it quite well I think in that regard to make it you know for quite a wide reach but the actual practical applications of it within you know for music for musicians is I think kind of a bit a bit unclear still and so this is one of the things that I've been kind of trying to figure out and navigate in this PhD which is on AI and music is how do we how do we, does AI actually need how does AI insert into the music production and musicians workflow in an actually kind of in an actually useful way and something that's not just sort of like shiny and, and hypey because there is so much hype around just sort of like using AI like this is an AI powered tool and it's actually interesting as I kind of like spent the first year looking at fitting neural networks into synthesizers and over the summer kind of pulled them all out and over the course of sort of a week took a bit of a step back and was like, okay, what if I just made like an 808 style snare drum and map from audio features from the input to those parameters and focus on making it real time and interactable. There's like no ML, ML involved, no AI. And it was like instantly playable. And it was like, oh, this actually works. <laughs> like this is a much better like interaction user experience than this thing I spent a year trying to develop. And it's actually not really clear how I'm gonna get this to work in real time. And I think there's some there's some interesting application of ML, but kind of like being a little bit more careful about, well, where do we insert ML and AI into this process? Um, and kind of coming from it from an angle of like, okay, what works, what's interactable? And then where am I looking for more? And I think that's where some of the decisions you've made in SP tools are really interesting, where you kind of like, 
you know, for example, the, the time travel stuff that you've been looking at, which I'm really curious to talk to you more about where sort of like, mm. you know, where are the limitations in what, what you have and where can we, where can we apply a little bit more tech and, and say like ML or AI to, to help us to achieve what we want. Um, and kind of starting from there, as opposed to being like, let's build a giant model, train it on all the data and then yeah. see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's funny that like talking to a, a friend of mine, PA from Flucoma, like, cause my, my tendency when I'm working with tech is to like, try to do things right. Air quotes, but, um, being perpetually unable to do so, but my sort of experience as a performer and a practitioner muscles through regardless so like it always ends up being like a pragmatic or not maybe pragmatic i don't really like that word but like a a practical hands-on kind of brute force um reduction of what i was unable to do you know mm -hmm. like a like um I icarus kind of thing where i'm trying to trying to get there but you know in, it ends up sounding interesting but not because i achieved what i set out to do but because i was unable to do so but with the scraps on the floor that didn't do the thing that they should ended up sounding kind of cool anyways and went forward with that so th there's a lot of that um good intention that doesn't work that then gets subverted but i i, I kind of I, I feel like i'm always trying to do that one i'm i'm, I'm always going for the sun but never never really making it um which makes me wonder like if i knew more would it sound worse you know but <laughs> yeah I, <don't> <laughs> I think you're maybe more i mean for me as soon as i sort of like got into the to more of the ml stuff i find that i'm like spending less time making music and more time more time waiting for gpus to finish running <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's yeah. a ba there's a balance there because I think there is some like interesting applications in that space, but we we're still working figuring out how to find them. Mm, absolutely. And so to unpack a bit of the stuff here, and and I'll, I'll kind of ask this in like maybe a, a sort of layman's term. So like the differentiable, so like the DDSP stuff, as far as I understood it, which is you know perhaps not very well, is that it's. DSP, but with, I guess, points at which you can verify and, and validate data along the way. Is that kind of... Yeah, the, the, the idea with the differentiable DSP is sort of coming out of, um, it's like, well, we have all these like great DSP algorithms um, for audio synthesis, for audio processing, um, but we can't really use them within neural networks right out of the box. Um, because they're not they're not differentiable and we need something to be differentiable so like in a neural network training you have to be able to compute some predicted output com compare the like, air figure out the air and then determine gradients for that so you can back propagate back to your say your neural network which has weights which you then update and so um for by making something differentiable then it allows you to actually like insert say a synthesizer directly within your neural network um, whereas some of the neural audio stuff before just used the existing neural network architecture, such as like convolutional layers and recurrent la layers to directly synthesize audio. Um, and then this, the DDSP paper came out and was like, well, actually we already know how to synthesize audio pretty well. Um, so let's use those. And then if we write it in something like a package like TensorFlow or PyTorch, which are Python libraries that have these like automatic differentiation functions built into them, then we can we can then include them in the um, in this training regime. Right. right. So that sort of was kind of like the big the big idea of that of the DDS DDSP thing, and it works really well for certain certain types of audio like monophonic. Harmonic audio works super well, allows you to do this sort of this really interesting timbre transfer task where you feed in, um, you know, a pitch envelope and a loudness envelope. And then the neural network has learned how to predict these time varying harmonic amplitudes. And so that gives you sort of like the timbre of the sound. And so say you learn, the network learns that the timbre as these time varying harmonic amplitudes of say a violin, and then you pass in the loudness and pitch envelopes from a trumpet and you get this timbre transfer to, to the violin. And so 
there's been quite a bit of work around applying this to say like speech and other types of instruments. Uh, it gets challenging. There's technical challenges around when you deal with non-harmonic sounds. And so this is some of the stuff that I was looking at over this last year and don't have a good solution for yet, but there's, um, yeah, there's more technical work being done in that, that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even in the, the bit that you showed of, of your paper, I guess, like trying to optimize for like transients, which can, I guess, get washed out in some of this process. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas like, that's pretty integral to most percussion type sounds is having a, a crisp or, or very defined transient. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, like I, I can I sort of made sense of that, but I, I just wasn't entirely sure. As I said, like, you know, like some of the heavier stuff is, is fairly new to me. Um, so in terms of what you're doing with the, um, the DDSP paper, with, like with the audio samples that you showed and with the, actually, that's a different thing. You sent the like 808 synth video and then you also sent um, like your DDSP thing, but like where yeah, you're sort yeah. of like playing objects and getting the, I guess, delayed parameter mapping. Idea, mm -hmm. which it seems yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. i was gonna say those are kind of like two maybe like two separate yeah, yeah. pieces of work the ddsp paper was looking at um it's like how can we apply this sort of like this ddsp technique to recreating drum sound um and i think that's going to be maybe like a longer term project of mine through the phd and then what you're yeah referencing about the like the 808 delayed delayed um, triggering thing doesn't actually use any ML at all. It's sort of just like a mapping, I think kind of more of like the SP tools paradigm of you know having an onset, detecting some features around that onset and then mapping that towards some sound making device. And in this case, it's just sort of like a, a really simple 808 style snare. And to kind of ask about some of the process there, um, what, what parameters did you choose? Because I guess you do, if, if I understood from the context or, or maybe the email, like I guess you do a 256 sample window to, to get mm -hmm. some initial stuff and then you have another doubled one at 512 that you then use for a secondary set of parameters and that's kind of it. So you just have two, two temporal moments at which you set the parameters. How did you determine, well, for one, those window sizes, but also what parameters you control in each? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So really the initial sort of temporal windows came out of, um, okay, well, I need the first, I want the first one to be quick, quick enough so that I can, you know, trigger the sound. Uh, so perceptually, I don't really get that sense of latency. And then the second one to be not too much longer, because if you update the parameters too much further in time, then you'll get that sort of like a weird parameter update feeling of like, start a sound and then the sorry, hard cut to the next sound. And there's maybe ways around that with crossfading, but I haven't explored those yet. Um, so for 5.12, it's just like, okay, this seems to be able to give me a, a little bit re better resolution for my, my spectral processing. And so the first one I'm just looking at, like a onset loudness. And then the second one is then computing just a spectral centroid to give you a sense of sort of like, I guess the, the timbre of that, that onset. Um, and so far, what I've chosen to map to has been very, um, it's kind of just been by trial and error. I sort of like have sit, sat down with the actual mapping and been like, okay, it seems to make sense to map um, like the loudness to a gain parameter and maybe like a little bit of, you know, like decay of the noise portion of the sound. And for the spectral portion of it, maybe it's like a mix between the mix, the, or sorry, the noise and the tonal portion of the sound and maybe something else. But really that, that part of the process has been very manual so far, just like a trial by error. What works for kind of different objects as I'm playing them. Yeah. And, and for that, it wasn't exactly clear from the video, but like, do you do any fingerprinting at all? Or is it like a moment now you're doing a snare voice and it's just that for a bit. And now you're doing sort of a, a kick voice and you're doing that for a bit. Or does it determine based on what you're doing, what sort of voice it's going to trigger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do with that was not use classification. And so it is just a single voice and, and kind of like achieving different drum sounds that are capable within this simple drum synth. Say I can kind of like use more noise for a hi-hat type sound and then, you know, less noise or like a shorter noise and a lower pitch sound for, for a kick. And that's just all achieved through, through mapping. So as I'm mm -hmm. playing in like these different, different onsets and different portions from sound, I was able to actually like get that sense of like a classification or distinct sounds just through mapping. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, and so, 
Yeah, it actually works surprisingly well for like a relatively mm. simple setup. I mean, the sounds are like, they, they don't sound like anything but like 808 style drum sounds, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was like I surprisingly playable and responsive. And so mm. I was like, oh, wow, this is like, you know, there might be something here. And I, I hadn't really thought too much about it, but I um, was at the AI and music creativity conference down in, down in Brighton at the end of August and was participating in a workshop there and had an opportunity to share that little demo video that I'd made. Um, and this came out of, uh, uh, like I took the class on Bella audio programming at Queen Mary this spring and made this as my final project. And um, so I was like, oh, this actually makes sense to maybe share this workshop. And the response I got was, I was, I was quite surprised by it. If you were like, oh, that was like, that's really cool. How did you do that? I want to like learn more about that. And um, Owen Green was there as well and said, have you showed Rodrigo oh. this? You got to show Rod this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. it, definitely a, a, a point of interest there. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds really cool and it's quite um, expressive. And it's, it's interesting to know that like that it's just the synthesis, the, the, the synthesizer, I guess you're using just has that breath to it and then your the way you've tuned the parameters i guess can give you you know the hi-hat sound or the snare sound um mm. yeah well, well, like when you mentioned that and I, you know i got my brain going a little bit and i was just thinking because certain parameters and certain time frames would lend themselves to being modified right away so even just thinking like like i guess an 808 kick where you often have like a pitch sweep down at the, at the, the start like on an initial trigger you just begin descending an oscillator and then when you have your your um, centroid, your, your 512 sample, then you stop at a point relative to that. So like segmenting the the type of parameters that you're controlling as to what's temporarily relevant. I mean, obviously you want some sound to start because that's important. And a lot of these drum sounds start with a little burst of noise anyways. So it can't go wrong with, with triggering a bit of noise at the start. Um, but then having things that are morphologically relevant as points of arrival at a secondary window to avoid this kind of like whoosh, kind of sound of like a parameter being like when you have smoothing too much smoothing you know you mm. get that kind of like a delayed schmear synth sound which kind of just ends up sounding laggier than than anything else Yeah, that's really cool. And with that, I mean, I imagine you've thought about stuff like this. Like, how do you deal with, because something we very briefly talked about the other day, but like morphology or specifically, what do you do after that um, 10 milliseconds is done? Like, you're, you're not stopping the sound. The sound's carrying on. Like, how do you determine how long the sample is going to be, what, what its contour is going to be for later, you know? It's funny. I haven't, I've thought a little bit about this, but I, it's interesting, we've been talking a lot about this sort of like, you know, what information do you need? Say if you're kind of, if you're playing a drum, like is, you know, obviously there's a lot of different gestures that you could do on a drum that carry on over time. Um, but, you know, say you like, you just hit a snare drum and there's that moment of impact. In that say like, you know, say 50 millisecond window of impact, is is everything you need to know about that that one gesture there in that 50 milliseconds do you actually need to know anything after that in order to like update this the the sound or say if you're like trying to transfer to some you know like some 808 style snare drum can you just take that 50 milliseconds of that gesture and is that enough to then control the rest of the signal or or is there actual benefit in taking the decay of the snare drum and applying something like that to the decay of the 808 and I could see cases where both would be would would work musically, um, but that's something I haven't I haven't explored too too much yet. Um, and I know that there's some there's some stuff that you've looked at in SP Tools where you actually have some kind of like some audio processors I believe where you can do is like kind of an EQ matching and a loudness yeah. matching after the fact. Yeah, so I'd be curious just sort of like what you know your thoughts just on 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 that if there's like from the acoustic drum like actually taking more information or if there's actually enough information in that initial initial period of time yeah i mean it's something i've thought about for a while and i've tried a couple different solutions and and i've 
arrived at an implementation in SP tools. But I, I guess there's a fundamental thing of not can't wait a long time in order f for latency reasons. And then um, depending on what you're doing afterwards, be it a synth or a sample or whatever it is, th there's a, a, a world of sonic possibilities that will absolutely and 100% be longer with which than the input that you're giving it just because of the nature of it. And because with this onset based things, like things like continuous parameter mapping is super amazing. And I would love to have there be more information, but often there isn't, it was that, that, that was all you got, you know, and even 50 milliseconds you're saying now, I was like, Oh, how luxurious. I, I wish I had 50 milliseconds of information. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm only using 10 milliseconds, right. With 512. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I haven't even explored that 50 milliseconds. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm squeezing all I can out of 256, you know, <laughs> It's like, I'd, I'd, I'd kill for, five, for 50. <laughs> um, but I, I, what I've arrived at is this sort of apples to oranges kind of um, paradigm where they're, they're disparate spaces. Like there's the input sound world and your output sound world and arriving at some meaningful correlation between them such that you can explore it as you would an instrument. You know, like if I have now, a, let's say I'm playing a piano. In fact, I have the pedal down. I have an expectation of that those notes are going to sustain. If I have the pedal uh, up, I have an expectation that they're not. And it's intrinsic to the instrument. Uh, my gesture is still small. I'm pushing mm -hmm. the, the, the wooden button down. Um, but my expectant result will, will modulate. So if I have a, a corpus of samples that's on the long side, I have an expectation that that'll be the case. Now, I've tried multiple things. And in SP Tools, I do kind of expose... I can do like same for same analysis. So like matching, let's say this, you know, the initial onset with the initial onset of the sample and then, then playing the rest of the sample regardless or a portion of it, you can change that. But like by default, if it'll do the short window analysis, match the shortest window analysis. And then what you get for the rest is bonus, but it does make for depending on your sound library, a very uh, correlated sound. As you put brighter sounds, obviously the, the attacker transient of a sound is very um, defined and definitive in terms of what you hear. Then I have one where you can, I mean, from the real time, you have very little options. So the, matching the short, and then I have like kind of like medium window, which I call it, which is 100 milliseconds. So I kind of compare this to that, or from that first window to the whole sample, regardless of how long it is. Interesting. And so for those, you have the short window, which you get from your input signal, that's 256 samples, you compute some features on those. And then you have in your, um, your corpora, you've done an audio feature analysis on those as well. Um, but then say, say you like you do it over the entire sample, um, you then summarize it down to a set of, of values. Yeah, so the, the set of like spectral centroid flatness MFCCs or yeah, yeah. So it, it in both cases the number the the amount of dimensions and um, the range is the same. It's because like they're in both cases they're they're summary statistics. They're just means or uh, um, and some derivative stuff, but they're it, the numbers look the same. It's just whether I'm comparing the smaller window to the small window or the small to the medium or the small to the large. And for some things, I mean, it feels different for each one. And as you can imagine, we have a very um, sharp transient with a long tail. Like I, I hit a, a bell sound, then it goes on for like 60 seconds. But most of that energy was in the first attack. The average of that whole signal is going to be way like the average loudness is going to be really low. The average centroid is, you know, everything skews differently um, for percussive sounds, sounds that fade out versus what the, the summary statistics would be for the sh like tiny window. So it's it's. I guess the, the the apples to oranges thing is that there's no way in which these worlds will overlap because of latency and, and things like that. So trying to have a, a correlation that is musically meaningful is the idea. And that's why I've, I've experimented quite a bit with um, different descriptor recipes and feature recipes and statistics and all of this to, to try to have a, 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 a very satisfying correlation that's possible there. And in the end, I, I talked about this briefly when we spoke the other day, but I found that for this, I leaned more towards the perceptual descriptors of like loudness, centroid, flatness, and pitch actually for drum stuff, I still found somewhat useful. And then a secondary statistic for each. So uh, derivatives for loudness, centroid, and flatness. And then for pitch, I take confidence. So I sort of do eight, uh, eight um, descriptors, well, eight features and compare those 
and I found that works kind of well. I've done stuff with um, MVCs as well, and I, I spent a, a, quite a while. So I worked on this idea of like LTEP, of mm -hmm. trying to, um, the stuff that was relevant to me was, I guess, like this here, loudness, timbre, envelope, and then pitch. So uh, lower, so to have mm -hmm. a reduced dimensional space that was summaries of each of these. And I experimented and, and got some decent results in the end where um, this is a, a 3D UMAP projection of each of them. So the loudness was, um, like, I mean, with loudness, there's not too much, but uh, the mean standard deviation, min and max. Timbre was a more complex one doing uh, MFCCs and then some statistics and then standardizing and then r reducing it down uh, with UMAP. And envelope, my thinking was to try to extract as much morphology as possible. Again, these are tiny windows. Um, so derivatives of most of the stuff. So almost all the derivatives, and which I actually found the version, I, I, I think this patch doesn't work at present because of the syntax has changed. But this was actually quite useful as a, as a feature space, I found the envelope one, and then the pitch also, and then combining them into an aggregate one, which I never really, I got working better than this, but my idea was to have a, uh, find the conceptual parameters that I found important, and then get reduced versions of each of those such that um, the loudness, the timbre, and the envelope were all equally weighted in the resultant feature space. So rather than having loudness, which is like three features, four features, and then MFCCs, which is like 100 features, um, all matching would be really skewed towards MFCC just because there's so much more of it present in the, the matching space. So I did experiment with this quite a bit. This was, I guess, ooh, like two years ago. I got some more with them, but in the end, uh, I found I just got better results by just doing a, a dumb version of just the loudness, like centroid flatness and stuff. But I did spend some time with this, and it's something I do want to get at more because I think there's yeah there's more to extract there, and I think for all the classification based stuff, I do use MFCCs, and it it does that sort of statistic or that sort of descriptor seems to work better for um, things like classification, and uh, but not I didn't find it as useful for um, just straight matching or regression type things but with my experience. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess it's sort of like you know, evaluating which which descriptors work particularly well. And in that, the, some of those examples you shared with uh, like the 2D, um, the 2D representations you got from UMAP, how were you, how were you exploring those spaces after you had created them? Were you kind of like looking at how they sorted samples or how did you arrive so, yeah. at like, this is better yeah. than that? And this is part of where, like, I, again, not being having experience with data science and stuff like this, it was all quite qualitative. Like, so I, I sat there with the and played with the UMAP, you know, with yeah. my mouse, and and like, oh, this kind of seems like it's clustering or, or organized in a manner that seems meaningful. And then, like, okay, that seems to be effective, and that was kind of it. So I wasn't comparing like loss or I was like I had no uh, meaningful things that I was I was pointing at. Um, so I just browsed them around, and then when I fused them together. Um, I did the same. So it was, I just basically vibed my way through those things yeah. to see how they, how they sorted things and tried it with different samples and different corpora. Um, yeah, that, that was the, basically the approach. Like almost everything in SP tools is that way. Some things I've spent more quantitative time with, like, like really like doing more tests and like looking at the accuracy, doing more tests and like to try to optimize like the classification stuff I've done that with. But this stuff, it was, it was just that I'm like, Oh, this, that seems kind of good. Okay. Let me try again. And then a lot of, almost what I was saying before, like this Icarus thing, like theory crafting. Okay, I think what matters to me is loudness and then timbre and then, and like, like what are these canonical things that matter and how can I then like capture them and have them weighted equally? So it was an exercise in almost um, philosophy there of like, what is, what is the essence of, of this drum hit, you know? And like, uh, and now how do I turn that to numbers was, was yeah. basically the exercise. <laughs> Still, ultimately, there's the apples to orange thing that like it's a tiny window, and the resultant sound can be infinitely long, um, which which happens with samples or with synthesis, and even like the 808 thing. Like, does your in in your example, do you ever get the symbol, or like do you get like a? Psh I think I don't know if I've designed it so that it can last quite that long, but absolutely, you could get you know like 
you know, I was experimenting with just like randomizing the mapping. Um, mm-hmm. And it's really interesting to see what you get because it doesn't like, there's not really any sort of perceptual. I mean, you can like inverse the gain relationship or inverse the, the noise relationship. And so it's sort of like you hit a kick and you get a long kind of like ride sound symbol or like a crash, you get the psh, and then you hit, you know, a hi-hat and you get like a, a kick drum. And so it's sort of like the mapping, the mapping is really dumb in that sense. Like there's no real, there's no real connection since it's just sort of like, it's a linear mapping from the input features to synth parameters. And so um, I think we like talked a little bit about that in the IDMT class last, was that last week or a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, about you were talking about using regressors and so actually creating some kind of like some more interesting nonlinear relationships um, for that, which is something I, I hope to explore a little bit bit more. But right now it's very, you know, it's 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 quite dumb and I can kind of like manually tune it in. It, it works pretty well, but um, I think some of these questions that you're exploring around what descriptors are the right descriptors, you know, what, what can I extract in that period of time and how can I use that to create a more musical interaction i think kind of like another thing you said earlier around like you want it to kind of like have it behave like an, an instrument and sort of like this this like concept of like could i is there a way that i could play this synthesizer like a percussion instrument and so as i'm playing playing on you know like a physical drum or a physical surface in some way where i'm getting these like slight gradients between different hits or timbral hits as i hit like the rim in different ways how do i can that be mapped to the synth? So it kind of like, it feels like I have that, like that smooth gradient in changes of sound. Like I do when I'm, when I'm playing a percussion instrument and it's not, it's not totally clear what the right way to even capture those, those little, those small timbral variations or loudness variations. I mean, loudness is maybe a bit easier than, than timbre, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of merit to just sort of like vibing on the, the descriptors because a lot of, I think of like something I found is that just because the loss is going down on an, you know, on a machine learning algorithm doesn't mean that it's becoming more perceptually relevant. Yeah. And so I think spending more time just like playing, playing with stuff is a really good, is actually a really good approach and sort of like one of the reasons why I'm trying to pull back a little bit and focus more on what sounds good, what feels good, and how do I slowly build up from there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, even retracing some of my own history with making music with computers was a a similar exercise. Like for a lot of people, you know, learning a bit of Max or something, oh, it's kind of confusing. You kind of hack together people's patches. And then there was a threshold at which I was able to use it in performance. And at which, Mm -hmm. like from there, like my, well, not only my learning went exponential, but like the the ideas that I could realize from how I would synergize with the technology. So like that, that kind of idea and that like your first level or your first order of ideas with a new thing tend to be kind of banal. It's like, Oh, like what if I took this and I, this, how could I combine them? Oh, you could put this on this or you could put this. And like, they're very like low level. And, and you might think you're having a big brain. Like, Oh, what if I put them sideways? But ultimately it's like, it, it's, it's stupid. These are bad ideas. It's not until you're inside of it and operating that you then like get, ideas that can emerge from that um under the surface area but not because obviously if you go very far and you have a very deep understanding you lose some of the facility and lightness of play that you might and that like knowing just enough but that that's mm-hmm. a maybe a little bit more tenuous of a statement to kind of make but um there is definitely something about learning a bit more about a thing and then that realizing more uh, meaningful or substantial ideas in that domain, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's an interesting, like knowing just enough. Well, I think that's actually a, yeah. a really interesting, <laughs> interesting concept when, especially when it comes to, to like, you know, creating things that are for musicians and for creating for creativity in general, I guess. Right. And, you know, there isn't really a right answer. Like there, you know, we can, it's an interesting kind of like, interplay in academia of trying to like write papers around this stuff and try to be like to show that it's like hey look it's like numerically this is improved like this is better but it's like is it actually better if you know for the musician and when you actually play it do you hear it um so yeah i guess it's like a follow-up on that like how much of how much of your ideas for development in sp tools is based on your practice like when you're behind behind the drums like are you thinking of new ideas or like primarily behind the drums? Um, it's a mix. Like, and, and for a project like this, because 
<clears throat> I mean, SP tools emerged from a mix of like, okay, I want to be able to do some of that stuff of what I originally saw in the sensory percussion things, but uh, in Max in a way that I have more control over. So like there was like a, um, a very clear task at hand. Um, and then eventually building that out and then deciding to share it. Like at some point it kind of morphs from my specific artistic practice to something slightly more generalized in terms of like there's objects in there that I personally don't use very much, but I think are useful for those people who might use the library. So there's like, mm -hmm. um, there's the version that I use, which is, is the same that everybody uses, but like I built it with a specific use cases for myself in mind. And then I then go into like, a, okay, if I was to round this out, how would, what's a more feature complete version of this idea or implementation? Um, but a, a lot of it is spent like, I, even just that idea of like that onset descriptors idea of, of like having an attack and then extracting a bunch of information on it has been like a slow burn of seven, eight, nine, ten years of, of trying to do something like that but lacking the knowledge for sure, but also the tools to a certain extent of, of getting that going. And then with something like Flucoma, that became uh, possible, both in terms of like my knowledge, but then also the being very uh, close with the development of that and like, oh, could we do that? You know, and, and having things optimized around being able to do stuff like that um, with a low latency and high priority and things where um, that wasn't the case. And there was one of the, the, the way that threading was handled, and it was Owen actually, I think who um, in one of the early development meetings was like, okay, look, we built this thing in, it's called rod mode. If you put it in this thing blocking two, you'll get the thing that you want. And I was like, really? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yes. And now it's, it's blocking two, but blocking two is uh, is rod mode. In, in, in <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, but yeah, so it was a combination of that stuff. But I think a lot of it comes from like playing. Like it, it, as I said, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a like, so I'm a musician. So I, I play with these tools. I use them. I, I perform and I think about ideas. I, I, this starts getting a little bit more tangential, but I, I improvise a lot, which I think for me, there's an aspect of play there that I think is not um, insignificant in terms of like play and it, it, like with the, um, the sort of explorative way, which also translates to code and ideas for coding. Even what I was saying before, like again, this like Icarus thing, which I didn't realize was going to be a running metaphor, but trying to do something and not being able to do that and then having something else that happens and then like, oh, that I'll, I'll do that. That's actually kind of cool. And having that lightness there, whereas I think, and this is maybe a generalization, but I think if I knew more, I probably wouldn't. I'd be like, oh, no, that's a stupid idea. Like, don't do that. Just try to do the other thing better, you know, but being being dumb enough to be like, oh, this is kind of cool. Okay, I'll do that, I guess. And then like, all right, that, that kind of works. And then from there, forking it out and, and building ideas around it. At the same time, I think, and I'm not super dogmatic because I know there's like um, like a lot of HCI stuff or NIME type things where this idea of correlation and very clear correlation between action and result and jitter and all that stuff is, is very um, uh, important and measured and like, like absolute is like, like, you know, gospel that like you, you need that there. I'm not super hard on that. I do think some correlation there is significant, but I think also having some like uh, noise in the signal as, as it were, is I think part of what makes an instrument feel like an instrument. It's part of why like a, an acoustic piano feels different than like a perfectly sampled equivalent. And it's the it's the noise in the signal. It's the unpredictability and the 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 the, the state of the strings that are already vibrating. So when you play it again, it's not you know. There's a lot of um, multivariant processes that are not tied to my intention. They're like they're they're I'm I'm present for them and they happen, and um, but they overall impact the efficacy of the instrument, like as a large, but also my my own apparatus with it. So like it needs it needs to not be perfect, I guess mm -hmm. is is kind of that which which I think I mean maybe there is some stuff in like the literature about that kind of stuff but most most of the time I've seen like where we need to correlate strongly your input with the sounding result, and there needs to be a very like non variant relationship there. Yeah, I mean it is in that's uh, super interesting and kind of I think one of the I, I think a little bit about some of uh, Teo Danaman in my. I, laugh. I might be pronouncing his last name wrong, but was into investigating all this sort of like the self-sabotage stuff where it's sort of mm. you, um, you're playing on your piano and then 
you press you press down a, a pedal and one note gets randomly transposed and so you're kind of like injecting this kind of like this this randomness into the system and investigating how that you know how that affects affects performance which is which is interesting uh but also it makes me think of kind of like you know the um one of the things i'm interested in synthesizers is that you you are going to get you know i guess in a digital synth you can pull up a preset and it's going to be the same every time but i sort of got my start and i realized how lucky i am now when i was at university of victoria in canada they had an old bukla 200 series um and that's what i got to start start learning synthesis on and it you, it was never the same every time you turned it on you would get something slightly different in the way you patched it you would never really be able to get it back but that was one of the most like beautiful things about the instrument is and made it a real instrument in that regard is that you were interacting with with the randomness of it and i mean they had this sort of like the source of uncertainty too which was you know very explicit adding randomness into your into your patch um and being able to kind of like have that that full depth of of sound, but being able to interact with randomness, um, and so uh, I just one of the things I'm interested in with using synthesizers is that you can kind of like potentially find those spaces in between, um, and things can you know sound different every time you you hit it. Um, yeah, and I guess sort of like where is that that boundary and that that I'm trying to find right now where it's like. You, it's predictable enough that it feels like you're you know what you're gonna get back it's not just like a random patch every time I you know I hit a drum and get some random sound back but it feels like there is some kind of like response where what I'm the energy I'm putting into this system it's acknowledging it and giving me back a sound that is makes sense in response to what I've put in but there is a little bit of unpredictability I hadn't really thought about the unpredictable part of it but I think that's actually really nice um, a nice thing to, to add back in there. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, again, this, this starts getting a little um, philosophical and stuff, but I think there's a significance of, because for example, there's like randomness, which yeah. which is a thing, but then there's also non, non, uh, there's things changing, but it's not random. Mm. If, if that sort of makes sense, where there's variation, but not random variation, which is sometimes leverageable in different ways. So, I'm reminded, and, and I could be wrong about this, but I think one of the like the magical things or whatever of like a, a hardware 808 is, the, let's say, like the kick drum oscillator is free running, meaning that mm -hmm. when you trigger the envelope, the phase of where that oscillator is is different. So like it's not like some poetic thing that some engineer in Japan came up with. It was a, a practical imitation of it. But if you have a sample version, like the phase of your sine wave thing is always going to be in the same spot. So it's something like that where, like, when you trigger the kick drum, kick drum again, it isn't ran, it isn't a random phase. It's mm -hmm. it's the phase is constant versus whatever the oscillator is tuned to. Um, but there's a I don't know. It, it it's I'm kind of maybe projecting like some some vibe stuff there of like, I it feels different. Like if let's say I have something mapped and I'm playing stuff, if parameters are controlled randomly versus a system that I don't understand. But there's like a a, a contour or an order order is not the right word uh there's something at play that isn't just like literal noise mm -hmm. um that i think can sound or feel different i know what you're saying because it's not just like you know there's enough variation that you're gonna get you're gonna get something something back within kind of like a space it's sort of like not the total unconstrained space of randomness but there is sort of like this space of variability that you're kind of like, okay, cool. I know something, something in that space is going to come out and mm. it's going to be you know, musically relevant, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe not. Like, I'm thinking now, like um, you might know better than me, but there's like, like that one chaos function where it, it sort of ends up in these stable configurations, but then nudges into like some other kind of thing, but it's sort of random, but it's not random. It's, it does this weird bifurcate, like it, it's, stable and then it kind of bifurcates in like these weird ways oh this thing whatever that thing is cool yeah and there's some like euro module about this and yeah you get these kind of weird gaps in how it behaves mm -hmm. um and i think mathematically is is i'm not super heavy on the math but like the function that produces that isn't super complex you're like where it, it ends up being somewhat stable but in a it's like an lfo or whatever but it's it's oscillating around 
this thing. It's not just, it's not a random thing, but if you, know, if you sample and hold this or whatever, it's, you're, you're functionally getting a bunch of weird numbers, but um, not this one and not this one and not this one. And there's like a, I don't know if it's perceptual, but there's, uh, there's an impact of that. Or maybe even like some of like the um, pitch sieve things or whatever, where there'll be, you know, some kind of um, pitch map, but with gaps in. I mean, I don't know if I'll find a good plot of it, like, but where, you know, it, it won't be just a chromatic space being represented. There'll be, you know, very, in his case, functionally derived gaps in, in pitch space that end up producing a sound because of their absence not because of their inclusion as such. Um, so this idea of when you end up with something like this, there's, I feel like there would be a sound or a feel or a vibe to this um, versus the equivalent of if it was all equal distribution across the whole way, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Where you get something more like white noise compared to you. This like slightly more organized space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and that being good or not is, is yeah, a separate thing, but like... Um, Mm -hmm. yeah what, what is this called oh no okay so this is a different one um okay. where it's sort of and this one i think is also kind of bistable where you'll be like over here for a while but then i'll go over there for a while but then i'll go over here for a while but that's a different one but this this other one that i had up is something as well it reminds mm. me a little bit of i had a euro rack module this like the chaos computer and it was this really it was some sort of function thing and every time you started it up it would have some random seed and it would produce something similar where it would kind of like it would go off for a while and it kind of felt random and then it might sort of like do this self-similar repetition within that so it wasn't this like it wasn't just a true like white noise sample and hold thing but you got these like patterns and it was it was actually it was super musical for a sort of like a musical randomness and i had no idea how it worked and there wasn't actually an owner's manual for it i guess sort of like <laughs> the i actually i haven't fact checked this but the like the reddit the reddit kind of word on the street was whoever was the main developer for this company livewire had had passed away before being able to write a manual for it and so there's sort of like there was some kind of like user made manuals online for it but no one really knew what was going on under the hood um i don't i don't, I don't know how true that is but i like the story i like the story of it and every time i flipped it on i was like yes <laughs> it's like mysterious random module yeah, I mean, we end up with like a tangent and a tangent there, but the, the idea of having a non-directly correlated relationship, but that isn't randomly variant, but that has, there's a systemic variance, maybe is a good way to put it, I think mm -hmm. ends up feeling meaningful as a musician. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think this is sort of like, this is actually interesting. I never really thought about it in in that way, but to kind of like bring it, tie it back to some of the, the drum stuff is sort of like, you know, being able to have different interfaces for synthesizers and being able to actually take acoustic information um, that has this natural variance built into it because we're dealing in in this space of like, you know, the real world space. And we get that kind of for just by playing our instruments. And how do we translate that to to a digital instrument? Can we do that? And is it possible to do it just for like through through sound and through audio feature extraction and descriptors like is do they capture that variance in a meaningful usable way yeah what, what's your what's your one word answer i don't know yet <laughs> that's <laughs> that's four that's four words that's yeah four yeah words. i mean i i have an optimistic yes for it but i think um i i also have a lot of uh confidence in the um the input side of that function i guess like as, as a human being in our adaptation to what then once it turns into numbers, we'll do like the, mm -hmm. the, the human part of that network. I have a lot of confidence in. But I mean, I guess we're getting you, in in your work in the SP tools. You are like you are getting something that you're able to you feel like there is like you're responding to it. Like it is responding to you and you're able to perform with, you know, your corpus selection or driving synthesizers. Yeah. And the synthesis one is, is something that I've, if it was in the works for the current update that I'm finishing now, but I didn't end up implementing it yet because I, I haven't figured out a good interface solution for it. But it's this idea of like parameter regression where like, you know, the, kind of doing a classification thing for, for this class has this set of uh, synthesis parameters and this class has this set of synthesis parameters. Um, 
because that's, I think, fine enough to do. And I think, you know, looked at that Sam Pluta thing where he does a lot of this uh, pr preset regression stuff with the joystick. <laughs> to make that because I, I think with percussion stuff specifically the smoothing thing is is an issue so like if, if you have too much smoothing and you hit the attack and, and every parameter goes ear it just sounds mm. you're just hearing the tail end of an envelope always as opposed to being the start of an envelope um but you know it's kind of hard because numerically if we just jump to a synthesis parameter that might be weird as well which is really i, I really like that idea of it was it franco um yeah yeah, yeah, like his thing of having the multivariant uh, envelopes going the whole time, maybe leveraging something like that for, um, but that, you know, is onset derived at the start, you, you know, or some sort of using a correlation, which is what I kind of do with the time travel idea where, I, you know, I give it a short analysis window and the longer analysis window and regress from that. But doing something like that where having this regression in terms of time series where you have your little analysis window and a, a finite amount of options for, um, you know, if I've got a drum as creative as I may be, there's a finite sound world that's going to come out of that object. It's just the nature of it. So given it enough examples to be able to somewhat predict if I hit it, if the start of the sound was this, I can tell with pretty good certainty that like half a second later, it was going to sound like this, Either, probably right. silence, but like, you know, there's only so many ways that's going to go. Um, and then being able to, perhaps from a singular onset window, derive multiple separate um, envelopes for different, like like what the um, like the loudness contour might be over that period of time, what a, the centroid might be over that period of time. With drums, we don't have a ton amount of variation in our the way our envelopes behave acoustically. But they could maybe have something where um, there are descriptor envelopes that can be then mapped to other synthesis parameters in a way that's um, musically interesting. You know, where mm -hmm. so to have something like, okay, when I hit this drum, I have this synth sound, and that's kind of cool. And when I hit it this way, excuse me, I have this other synth sound that's kind of cool. And not necessarily a morphing thing, but have some relationship built between them where the, the, the morphology of it is interesting and complex. So kind of like a fusion between your your uh, direct like mapped 808 thing and the guitar what was the name for his i think he calls it basil's bezel's trick oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah bezel's trick yeah something like yeah. that where we have the onset begins it but then you have this cascade of envelopes which then map to whatever synthesis parameters which i guess in his case is fm synth but it, it, it could be whatever mm -hmm. yeah yeah where frank frank was got the and kind of like this continuous envelope thing coming in and um i think it's loudness and pitch i believe and then estimating the the different output envelopes amplitude envelopes for his different operators and then fm synth um and it works it works quite well um so yeah i'm not sure what like what that would look like for drums like introducing the onset detection portion of it and um can you from that like that small section then estimate a series of envelopes for for your drum synth yeah, yeah. I, I mean even just having two envelopes like a, a pitch uh, sorry an all loudness and then rather than pitch maybe a centroid or something like a, a uh a frequency based envelope of some kind mm -hmm. would be massive like like being able to to and maybe a hybrid approach where you have like a small analysis window and you you, you that determines your starting value or whatever mm -hmm. um and then from there the it begins moving in a direction at which is then resolved by what the next analysis window 
arrives at. You know what I mean? Like your envelopes begin and start moving and then the other one is this. Okay, we will get to there. Or if they're somewhere higher, they get, you know, they kind of carry on to wherever that would be. Um, Could I think be quite uh, musically satisfying, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's something like in the previous updates, I think the version seven of SP Tools, when I I introduced a bunch of synthesis things and like a couple algorithms that I found. And I'd like to add more of that, but I, um, yeah, there's only so much time in the world and, you know, when it gets to physically mo- physical modeling stuff, that gets also quite heavy as well. And yeah, so I, I only added a few things. But one of the desires for adding stuff like that is to be able to then control it with the audio input. At the moment, I have these kind of algorithms and you can use them, um, but there's nothing to tie the descriptor analysis to them directly mm-hmm. in a way that like you're doing or Frank was doing, which is something that I've it's it's on my list of, of things to work on. So it's kind of serendipitous to have this chat mm-hmm. because I haven't really unpacked that. Um beyond this idea of like let's say classification as preset, which is very um it's one of the low level ideas. I think it'd still be quite musically interesting, but I don't think it's the the full answer yet, you know? But I think it would be cool to like this class is now this preset and this class is that preset and or even regressing it, like somewhere in between gives you this other preset. Yeah. Um, and this is stuff that and- Andrea was exploring a little bit mm. with his uh, his hitar, where you do or training training some neural net to do a classification between, say, like on your you know percussive finger style guitar playing, um, and then using those. Sort of, I think it was it was quite interesting, like training a classification model, but then taking off like the end layer that actually does the classification and using these sort of uh, directly using the I think they call them like the logits, which are kind of like range between zero and one. Um, and sending those to to synthesis parameters, um, and so that can kind of give get you into this realm of starting to do a little bit of like an interpolation between or morphing between different sounds. Um, I'm not sure if you would get kind of like a really clean morph, like say if I'm like you know tapping here and then I move over here, if it, you'd really get this sort of like this really nice smooth transition, um, you might, uh, but. I'd be curious because it's sort of like even just in a in a in a synth like morphing between two parameters it's sort of like the the space of a synth, like synthesizer is so non-linear anyways that it's sort of like you probably would fall into some weird areas along yeah. the way and it would be you'd have to do some kind of like non-linear mapping to get from one space to another um mm-hmm. but it's definitely super interesting work and andrea was looking at uh, using some models informed by like, drum transcription and and training those up and i think they worked quite well for the classification case and using a relatively small window too Yeah, yeah, I was having a look through like um, a few of his videos and, and papers and stuff like that. With a guitar, I think you can get away with longer windows. So I, th- I think if I'm correct, he was using like 22 sample. So I guess, what is that, uh, 1024? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah he I don't remember where he's, like this is I guess the existing ones, but I don't know where he says where he does his. But it was definitely longer than 256, I remember that. It was longer than 256, yeah, I think input window to be 512 samples yeah which i think for guitar is is fine because the even though he's hitting the guitar and you hear the percussive sound i i don't think it's as short i don't know it, it seems more permissive and like it like i can hear a bit of the latency but i'm fine with it versus like i in, in a way that i think i wouldn't be if that was a um a drum for example um, but one of the things, I, and I forget in which of the video, but he does something where he does, I guess, a synthesis mapping. It was funny because in the video, I, I hear that um, the slew preset synth morph. So he'll hit a sound and every sound sounds like ew, ew, re, ew, because like he, the way that the smoothing is set up. But like, I think in one of them, they, they have it connected to, I don't remember which video. Yeah, the idea of like um, morphing between things, because it's something that I've tried implementing a lot for this current version and I was never able to get a satisfying result. I got something that kind of crudely went 
if I have this class and I have this class and I'm moving between them, it kind of some goes in that direction. It's absolutely not smooth and it jumps around like crazy. And I think for one, I'm limited by my knowledge, but I think also to a certain extent, the way that I'm trying to do that in um, with Flucoma and Max is probably not the appropriate way to do that. Where I think for that, I was using k-means and finding the distance. Like I would take the the classes, set them up as clusters, um, and take mm -hmm. their means, and then go with the distance to those means, which is probably not a useful way to try and do that. Interesting. And so this was like, what, is, are you working with a synthesizer? Is that the... No, in, in this case, it was just a, for number wise. So like the idea being, let's say if I hit the center of the drum versus if I hit the edge of the drum, if these are trained as separate classes, as I move from the center right. to the edge, have a, a number that moves, which could then get mapped obviously to whatever. Um, but being able to determine um, the classification works fine in SP tools. If I hit the center, if I hit the edge, or if I hit whatever hits the classification is quite accurate. So mm -hmm. I've gotten that to a satisfactory point, but the, then between, but I haven't tried stuff, I guess like what you're suggesting, like interrogating other parts of the network. Um, so in, in SP tools, I'm, I have now two versions of classification. So I have the previous version was just doing like a nearest neighbor, um, like a KNN classifier. And now I've added for the, the upcoming update, I have a, a, an MLP. So like a neural network, one where you give it the classes and you put it to train for like two minutes or whatever. And it, I found that it's, it's more accurate, but it was actually also faster, which is a nice perk. Like it, it returned, uh, I guess it queries that space. Maybe the, the networked version of the space is uh, faster to navigate through than the, just the na nearest neighbor tree or whatever. Um, so I do have a version that now I have a, a neural network version of the classifier with a, a like it's I forget what the structure I used for it, but um, I haven't tried poking at that. Like this is sort of you said at the end. Yeah, you might be um, able to take off like the last layer and see what those values are before they're sort of reduced to certain certain classes. Because um, you might get depending on how it's trained. Say you have like you know three three classes and you're going to have kind of like a one hot encoding at the end where it's like you know this output goes high if it's you know the edge this output goes high if it's you know the middle and this one if you're kind of like training i don't know what you're hitting the side of the drum um so you'll get kind of like i guess you could call it like a confidence level in each of those for for each hit whether or not you would get it kind of like as you move closer as you would get kind of like a raising value i'm not i'm not sure because it wouldn't be you know, you're training it to be able to distinguish between these different classes and not, not necessarily training it to know the difference between, you know, hitting here versus hitting over here. Um, if it's still all on the drum, it's kind of like what it's trying to figure out is like, okay, how do I know if you're hitting the, the rim versus somewhere on the drum? And so mm -hmm. it's, a uh, yeah, it would be interesting to say you like, you know, if you trained, say you train with two classes and one is like in the center of the drum and the, uh, the other is on the edge. Um, and then you kind of had like the probability of center versus probability of edge, whether or not you would, you, you like kind of maybe like just took a mean of those two or something like that. If you could then get some sort of like interpolation between, between that. Um, yeah. so it'd be something to, to experiment or even just sort of like training a regressor to give you kind of like train a, a regressor to give you a value of one, if you're in the middle and a value of, you know, something else over here. And, mm -hmm. and then use that as a potential way to kind of like to morph out. It might be noisy, but, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah, it's something I've, I've wanted, like I, at the moment I got, it was not usable. I, like, I decided not to implement it, but I did for all my classification, I'm doing MFCC with some stats about like a hundred dimensions of MFCC soup. And, um, I did, I think a, a PCA where you keep, um, X amount of the variance, so like keeping like 90% of the variance and that brought it down to like 20 dimensions or something and then a UMAP after. So like I did a few steps of reduction to get it down to like 10, 5, 10 parameters, something like that. And then did something like this and it, it sort of moved in the direction, but yeah, very noisy um, and not in not a, a, a useful enough way. But as I said, I, I wasn't doing anything with looking at um, like the, the, the network nodes in the middle. So I'll have an experiment with that to see. Because I think the results I was getting prior to this is, I guess the classifier is really good. Like it would flip-flop a lot more. 
So like it was, oh, it's this or it's this. But like the area in between, it just seemed to just kind of jump and like quite confidently tell you, oh, no, you're this one or no, you're this one. But like when it was unsure, it was still like, oh, I'm unsure, but it's definitely this one. But I'm sure, but it's definitely, you know, like it. there was not a lot of stuff in the middle. It was like kind of near the edges. As you're training it up as a classifier, it's going to try to kind of like to push one way or the other. It's sort of like you're not, it's not learning to kind of figure out the spaces in between because that's not in its best interest when you're, when you're training. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that, that's one of the things I, 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 I pushed it forward because I, it, it's, it's still a, a mountain yet to climb. But um, I, I guess rewinding a little bit to this idea of mapping to the larger spaces, like even just like, I guess, pie in the sky, spitballing, let's say you have an object or an instrument or a drum or whatever it is, and you have a human input to it. Um, what would you, let's say, if if you needed to play, let's say, a full array of, of drum sounds, including cymbals and long sounds, but from acoustic input as a source, what would you do to arrive at like, now this song is going to be a symbol and it's going to be long? Yeah, I don't know about the the how-to part. I guess that's the kind of like <laughs> the, yeah. the to figure out. I mean, sort of like in, to talk to, to go back to the like the Icarus metaphor of like <laughs> what, what I would love to be able to do, like kind of my dream, and this is probably not achievable in a PhD, is like to be able to to have some kind of interface where I'm like, I want it to sound like, you know, like this this set of sounds, maybe I had a set of like, you know, drums that they were like, you know, recorded at Abbey Road Studios or, or a set of other kind of like recorded objects. I'm like, this is what I want to play. And I could drop those audio files into some interface um, and then naturally be able to just transfer whatever I'm playing to, to those sounds where I sort of like resynthesizing them and naturally kind of get the, um, the timbral changes of what I'm playing imparted on on those sounds and so that's sort of like you know the dream version of it is that you would just kind of like naturally handle those longer sounds like if i have you know play a symbol it's going to recognize that as a symbol um and transfer it to a symbol on you know whatever drum set or if i play brushes or some kind of like continuous type note that it would figure out okay great like you're playing this sort of like this longer more sustained gesture so i'm going to like you know replicate that in the exact inner workings of how that works is I'm not, I'm not totally sure yet. Right now I've really been just kind of like focusing on say, say I can do just like a singular, a singular drum. What would it, what would it look like? Say I have kind of like my target drum space, which is, you know, a set of toms. I have a recording of this tom being played a lot of different ways. I can find some set of synth parameters that replicate that relatively closely, or at least can replicate the, you know, the timbral changes in that space. And then I can then map from that, from whatever instrument I'm, I'm playing. Um, and so that's sort of the goal in, in terms of like the longer, the longer sounds, um, like a crash symbol, if I play, play a crash, like should the length of that crash be transferred over to the target instrument? I'm not, I'm not totally, I'm not totally sure about that actually. Um, maybe that could be an option where you're sort of like, you know, also consider the length of each sound and apply that as sort of like some, some sort of envelope to your synthesized space. Um, or maybe not, maybe you just want to take, take the actual, like the gesture in itself, um, regardless of the resonance of the drum it's and and impart the performative aspect, like the gesture on your target space. Yeah. 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 Which is. A, a good way of putting that, I think, and I think for me, I was also thinking of like what the, what the gesture, what the nature of the gesture would be, I guess, as opposed to like the technical machinations to make that then be the case. Like if you were at, I mean, if you're at some kind of acoustic kit or electronic kit that you can more clearly like I've hit a symbol, so a symbol thing will happen. But like, let's say you have a box or, a, you know, a little cookie tin or something, what I mean, you can do the classification route, I guess, like a fingerprinting thing. But if you had a, this continuous mapping space as you do now, yeah, what, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess this was like an apples to oranges um, mm -hmm. nature of a question. Like, how do we correlate short things to long things in a meaningful way um, is, I guess, the, the more succinct version of that question. Yeah, that's a really interesting because, like, if you, you know, say you have a, a long thing, it's going to change the way, the way you play it. 
um, your gesture is going to change naturally. And so, you know, can you, can you map something, say like hitting a cookie tin that has a very, sh you know, it's a short sound resulting sound from your gesture. You know, what is the right way to map that to something that's going to be, be long. Um, mm. and I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally sure on that, that one. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. I guess there's sort of like you run into some technical problems to say you're like, you have this continuous, continuous space. It's one, you know, one synthesizer. If you have a long sound, you know, what, what happens when a new gesture comes in? Do you sort of like let that ring out? Do you, I mean, those are kind of more basic technical synthesizer voice, voice stuff. But one thing that I, I, I was thinking about, um, the other day is this idea of having a pseudo predictive riser, like drum riser esque type sounds of having something where you have continuous, but fluctuating gestures that are often used, let's say like for a riser, let's say I'm going to have like a reverse snare type sound where I'm going to hit the snare, but there was like a coming before it being able to operate or have either synthesis or samples or textures that sound this way. Obviously, they don't know when you're going to make the actual sound, but having some way to make that perceptually masked to having like, uh, let's say let, uh, there's a texture uh, to, to simplify the example. I want a reverse snare type sound, but coming from like a, a, a drum brush type texture that is sure, sure. where it's like it's coming and going and having and flowing where... I want to now, I, I'm going to hit the drum, but I want it to have been preceded by some kind of riser-esque thing. And I was thinking of, for one, either having a, a kind of way to modulate or have something where there's like an undulating thing with what, its own parameter and world and logic and all that. But having inter-onset timing, analysis, dynamic time warping, predictive, basically you would train it up on some of your playing and gestural timing in general. So on some of your rhythmic and like language would might predict. So it might think that, okay, this thing might be coming. So I'll kind of swell a bit, but if nothing came kind of swells down, but where it would, it would surf to meet you there with the mm -hmm. idea that sometimes it would, and it would be doing the thing up. And then you as a musician, I also might sync up with that. And like, you might then get the sort of reverse snare type sound. Mm -hmm. Um, as a way, and at this point, it's almost like pseudo accompaniment, but pseudo textural, pseudo. I mean, I think there's a lot of sound. I mean, a reverse snare would probably be one of the more boring, boring implementations. But this idea of having um, a pre, pre gestural information that's still correlated to onsets, in a way mm -hmm. that is uh, not pre, not defined. So not like when I always hear the riser, I know it's going to be like 300 milliseconds later will come that sound, and I'll try to hit it, but where it comes and goes with it in a way that um, could be, I don't know. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah. That's cool. So it's almost sort of like, almost like musically informed sounds to a certain extent where it's sort of like you have something that is potentially like listening to you and kind of like get into a rhythm of what you're playing. And then if you do some certain gesture, then it would be like, okay, cool. I'm going to start to like rise up in the right sort of like feel of this music up to that, that point but also be kind of like co-located with, with onsets potentially. So you're kind of like, you know, gets into the rhythm of it almost. Is that sort of, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Which becomes yeah. easy if you're doing like straight time-based music because then there, there's all, like only so many logical places it can happen. But if it's a little bit more free, that becomes uh, harder to do. Um, so I was thinking of something like that where either training it up on like just inner onset timings for a while and then from that mm -hmm. have it like, expect this is sort of roughly the language that's going to be happening rhythmically and as it's just getting new onsets in it's okay i'm here in the prediction or in the network so that means probably something eventful is going to happen here or not because you know we're not infinite variance machines like we'll have a finite set of rhythmic language that's available to us at any given point so that was something i was thinking about in terms of it's solving a different problem but like the 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 past problem you know like the the computer doesn't know what i'm gonna well i guess it's a future problem but relative to an attack it was it's the past of the attack um mm -hmm. i can't when i've hit a drum i can't have already have started a sound before it you know before it happened yeah that's interesting i've been thinking a little bit about maybe it's a similar similar idea but to kind of to combine these ideas of having something that's continuously going 
um, like a continuous, maybe you're like mapping from, from envelopes to some sound and it's sort of like kind of always there bubbling under the surface. And maybe you do something like a brush and it's sort of like, oh, here's a continuous gesture. I'm going to kind of like rise up. Um, and then when you have like an actual real onset, like something kind of like discrete happens, then your other system takes over. Um, and sort of kind of have the two sort of like going, going together. And potentially this continuous system could even like react a little bit quicker than the onset, the onset system. And you could, you could add in also like a bit of, um, some of like the more predictive, say like rhythmic elements to this continuous sound generator. And that could sort of like move in, move in with the onset stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is one of those places where there's, I think some conceptual surface area in terms of, because what we're talking about here is is both a technical and aesthetic slash philosophical concern. You know, like there's there's a technical thing that needs to happen in terms of uh, things like this to work as these do. But this idea of having continuous behavior that's uh, interrupted with pointed moments is is uh, that's kind of like a music thing. You know, in terms of how we how we do that with computer is is a uh, is a different concern, but they're, they're, it's, they're, it's a similar problem in both as a technical domain and as an aesthetic domain. So there's like a, some surface area there for the, the, there to be interdomain solutions that make sense musically, but also technically. And even in that, like this rewinding back a bit, like the human to computer part of the network as such, like if you're playing with this riser machine or whatever, um, yeah. you would also adapt to it, you know, like, so it, it would be self, uh, the feedback network would be there as well. So you would adapt to it and it would adapt to you. And so you're likely to, if you hear a swell, you might then go to do it. Whereas if it, if it wasn't there, it wouldn't be the case, you know? Mm. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Have the sort of like the, the, the adaptiveness of the system and how that affects yeah, yeah. you or the gestures that you play. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you find that even like, do you play play your your SP tools stuff differently because you know because of the certain like gestures that you know it will respond well to versus others it won't? I mean, maybe I guess even like at a very basic level, understanding the onset detection stuff fairly well, knowing where I'm playing relative to that, you know, so. Um, and expectations there. And so if I did a thing and nothing happened, I might know why, you know, so like there's like a under the hoodness of that. But I think beyond that, maybe not. But I think because a lot of that has been me coding around these musical ideas and intentions to, to put the framework up. So like, it's more likely going to uh, generally do what I thought it would because I was the one coding it as well, where that might be the case. It might be different for you or someone else who is using it, but they're, um, and not so much that like an under the hood understanding of the technical part of it, but the musical intention or, um, aesthetic intention is not necessarily, um, completely aligned. And this is not a, a good or bad thing. It's, 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 uh, just a statement in which case that some some of that might be more the case but with for me there's those things are kind of aligned that that plane is uh continuous i guess you know like this stuff in general because i've been sharing patches for like a long time like for almost as long as i've been coding for for better or worse like i, I shared very bad patches at the beginning but um it almost all of my work with a computer has been multi-variant in that way like it's stuff i'm using but also considerations for other people using kind of almost always and all, like there's very few patches other than like it's like like work in progress things that i just don't end up going anywhere um but like there's there's not so much a part of me that uses a computer that isn't also public facing if that kind of makes sense in, in a way that i think is uh perhaps not always the case but for me it's inseparably the case so it's hard for me to have a perspective on what that means you know um, like, I don't know what it means to write music software that I don't use. And I don't know what it means to write music software that someone else isn't going to use, you know, cause they're like, they're, it's the one and the same, you know, that's cool. I re that's one of the things I think about, just to, about what you do that I, I, I admire is how much you, you focus on putting stuff out there and making it open source and accessible to people. I think it's 
just, yeah, super cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, for me, it's, it's not an insignificant thing. And, you know, it gets broader and philosophical and, you know, decommodification and sharingness and openness and human consciousness. You know, there's a whole whole um, thing there. But I think the ultimately the that sharing of work in that way is is for me equivalent as to like an aesthetic sharing. Like I like making music and sharing that, and I like making tools and sharing those as well. And they're um, they're different things, but they're equally uh, important in uh, a cultural sense. I think in, in in the sense that I guess what I'm saying is that with that crude summary, is that sharing code is an aesthetic gesture. I guess is is mm-hmm. what I'm getting at. Um, not because the the code can then make sounds, but the the act of sharing code in in and of itself is is the aesthetic communication and is is part of an aesthetic com- continuum um, that I think is uh, undervalued. But th- that's value is a bad word there. Like I don't mean monetarily. I think it's perhaps underutilized. Maybe I'll go with that. Yeah, um, I mean, is it? I don't know what I do without all the the open source code just sort of like available right now it's most of most of how i've learned how to do what i what i do is like pouring through people's github repos and so i mean i'm very appreciated that it is it is a thing and there's a lot of stuff out there that is not not open source um in like the audio dsp world um but a lot a lot is and so it's i mean and a lot of people leverage that and i i I am I, i do feel good that a lot of there is a big push in ml and ai deep learning to, to publish code and to have open data sets. And I think that's been probably a big reason why there's been so much growth in that, that area over the last few years too. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it's in, in thankfully in, in, well, UK is not in Europe anymore, but in Europe that, that sort of uh, the, it, the publication is contingent on sharing those things often, um, mm-hmm. which I think is important because yeah, you need, you need kind of the data and all and like the stuff underlying it is, is quite important to share as opposed to just having the closed source things. Um, it, it's kind of like randomish, not randomish, but like a tangential thing there. Like uh, to sort of ask you a question, like how do you feel being a human agent, uh, like in a coding environment where sometimes it feels that, and maybe you're closer to the ML thing, which is why I'm asking you, that it feels were just before. <laughs> Uh, a kind of like an eclipse of garbage <laughs> and and what i mean by this is like the like all the you know the large language model things just filling everything with junk like you know it's soon going to be i mean as it is it's hard to google for anything cuz you just get seo garbage or you know chat gpt fake blog articles and stuff uh, you know and and the copilot thing on github like i think we're we're not far from there being like hard to get uh actual <laughs> code oh, <no. laughs> or me, like i don't know it, it, it's sort of a, a kind of a playful know. question but it feels like to a certain extent that we're you know just before this crashing wave of like oh you know when i was younger i used to be able to go out and find things but is before the cloud of language models just obfuscated the sun and you know yeah there's a, a playful question in there like <laughs> i guess my like my first reaction or like thought around that is yeah yes it's absolutely happening but maybe a hopeful answer is that it sort of like encourages people to do more stuff like this is to have conversations with other people and look for the person behind 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 the output and sort of like kind of following following individuals and individual contributions as opposed to just sort of like you know like kind of blindly searching around for things i mean certainly it's like i use copilot at it's you know, a fancy, a fancy audio autocomplete, a lot of the kind of like the, the more like, you know, print me out a function that does this. It doesn't work super well for that. It hallucinates functions all the time. I get a lot of things <laughs> where it's sort of like, oh, if this function existed, it would be great. It, like it's named like, you know, split audio and resample, um, you know, insert uh, like file name. Yeah. And it's like, if that file exists, that function exists, it would be perfect, but it doesn't exist. Like it just was hallucinated. So, I mean, there's still yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots to figure out within those spaces, but I mean, those are, those will be figured out. And so I think, yeah, you'll, there's, there is a flood of, of information and just the things are becoming kind of littered. And so, yeah, I guess to my hope is that it's going to kind of like, people will want to, in, to interact with real people and, mm. and, have those conversations because that's actually like the fun of it is collaborating with with people at least that's my sort of like my take on it 
um, is I want to make things for other people. Um, you know, I don't know, we might end up in a place where we have machines making music for other machines that are just sort of like consuming them on Spotify or whatever, but yeah, yeah. that'll just, that'll just happen and maybe make it harder to find music. But maybe that means people will be more inclined to go watch real people to make, make more, make real music. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it would, it would free us up from having to listening to the AI music if, if the AIs just listen to it themselves. <laughs> like, like if all the robo callers just called all the robo, you know, uh, like a hold attendant things, then we would, yeah, we won't have to deal with those calls anymore. So yeah, maybe that's a, <laughs> a silver lining of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think I generally have a, a fairly optimistic view, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it just feels like a lot of that. And I, I think I saw some article or paper or whatever the other day. Um, like presently is the last of um, there's no there will never be a large language. Not that this is a positive thing, a large language model, but there will never be a large language model that isn't corrupted by the output of large language models like that. It's no longer possible for that to be the case. But it, this idea of being certain things being past a threshold, even in like an as an as an asinine thing like this, like. Um, all language models have that, you know, stupid, uh, what's a country that in Africa that starts with K or whatever. I don't know if you like, I give you, actually, let me try that now. A country in Africa that starts with K. Well, there are 45 recognized countries in Africa. None of them begin with the letter K. The closest is Kenya, which starts with a K <laughs> sound, but is actually spelled with a K sound. <laughs> And uh, I mean, this is like a snippet that's come up, but like if you put it in quotes, it does come up. And it's, it's, I, I it was like a meme that I read about. Well, the origin is like kind of a meme thing where that it then polluted into one of the models and then it propagates because of how the models work. But like, this is just kind of baked in to stuff, you know? Yeah. And that's there. That's now, that is now you can, you can Google it and it will be used by web crawlers in the future yeah for sure and it like because of the nature of how networks work like it's self proper like the, the the propagation has nothing to do with the validity you know that mm -hmm. like it, it will like it's it posts and people post it because it's funny and it's a meme and then that makes reinforces it in the model and like you know we might have to dis dis uh whatever the country like when you dissolve the kenya you know just to satisfy the meme you know, they just have to get rid of it as a country. To... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's interesting that it's like doing up like a perceptual thing. It's like, it sounds like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, cross sensory or whatever um, projection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very tangential as well but um some of this like this is this synthesizer parameter mapping stuff i've like been running some really early early initial experiments on it using genetic algorithms um to like estimate estimate parameters or to like really quickly cycle through and kind of like create these create these like you know ideal or optimal parameter mappings to sort of like to fit to you know to fit a, a function or a guess or to fit a uh, a target sound so say i like pass it in um you know, a drum sample where I'm like, okay, I want it to, you know, create, give me like a target sound and then a mapping to that sound so that I replicate that as closely as possible. And that's been kind of like an interesting approach for exploring some of these, like these parameter mapping spaces. Yeah. And, and that Simplant thing that you sent is, is a really, I think, cool and elegant uh, implementation of idea like that in, in particularly like the, the play sense in that I presumably they're doing some nice hearty, ML stuff under the hood, but it's presented in this organic plant evolving. Like the the metaphor layer is quite 
readable as a human. You know, like you don't have to like, oh, functions and, all, you know, you don't have to get like all yeah. numerical with it, but you kind of understand that you can see the thing and it grows and evolves and it matches. And like, I, I think they did a really good job with the metaphor of how to communicate mm. that, which I think is, uh, it can be a, a, a difficult thing for things with machine learning or AI where you, it, oh, this is kind of cool. Well, you want to learn about this. Well, let me tell you about regressors. You got to, you know, you, you have to, like the amount of preamble that's required to communicate the idea can be um, uh, dis dissuading. Yeah, I think that Simplan is a, one of the, it's a really good example, maybe like one of the best example I've seen so far of for like integrating this, that type of ML AI application for with synthesizers that's now like commercial. And it's really cool. There's a, quite a bit of history in that, that type of research. It was sort of like, I think in 1993, the first paper was published using genetic algorithms to tune tune synthesizers. And there's been a, like a significant amount of work trying to like improve this. And so this is, you know, kind of cool 30 years later, it's actually like finally, <laughs> finally in a plugin, which is really cool. Yeah. It, it like, I was watching some of the videos and stuff before we, we met up today. And I mean, I've not looked at much and I've, I've not played with it myself actually, like how, if you've used it or have experience with it, like how does it fare with, uh, on the weirder sound of the like how does it deal with weirder sounds or more chaotic sounds do you want to listen to a couple um so they have this really cool is it this yeah so here's this sort of like the sound matching feature where you can go in and load a reference sound um so here's just like say like a kick drum that's it's like dirty kick sound mm -hmm. and then you hit this uh generate like relatively quickly like is able to sort of like go in and figure out some and so I, i'm not sure exactly what's going on under the hood to get it, to get it to that place so quickly but then obviously doing some sort of like genetic out evolution to be able to kind of create some variations and there so some of them have like lots of reverb compared to the the original but it's it's certainly it's doing not a bad job of just like the attack yeah, yeah okay and you can set the window at which it analyzes as well i guess yeah oh that's true yeah there you go you can gotcha. so it looks like it will cut it off so if you have over whatever this is like two yeah. two seconds or something like that mm -hmm. and that's probably like a limitation of if it is using a neural net under, under the hood there's probably like a limited window size it can take in Mm -hmm. And even this is sort of like the UI experience of it is, is interesting watching this sort of like these weird little DNA gene strands. Yeah, yeah. So I'll pause it there. Let's see how. So it's yeah. getting kind of like this, it's trying to get the kind of like the delay, but it's in from the kind of like the, the brush you can see. And it's probably using like, if you look at the actual like patches it found, it's sort of like some kind of like repeating LFO to try to get kind of like that swoop from the brush. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could then Kind of like turn that down. Used obviously using like a ton of like the reverb. Um, see if you like turn off the reverb. Oh, actually not too crazy. And it's like a relative. I mean, the cool thing about it is a relatively simple synth. Um, I mean, simple, but like it has a a couple of oscillators with some like some. This is like a random noise oscillator. Then some other oscillator and they can kind of like modulate each other a little bit. Um, a couple envelopes and LFOs and then some like a filter and a reverb. And so it's, it's actually quite impressive to see, to see the kind of the complexity of sounds that is able to match just yeah, kind of yeah. through that, through this like relatively simple synth um, or definitely nothing like nothing too out there in terms of sort of like synthesis methods. Yeah. I'm, I'm more than anything curious how it fares with, yeah, the otter sounds and stuff, the, the, to see what the, I guess the noise of the system, it gets introduced in the translation, you know?
Yeah, so I mean, I, I really like, I, I like that idea, that sort of like presentation of audio to a system and then being able to manipulate it after that. Cool, man. Um, awesome. Yeah, let's, let's stay in touch. I'll email you that stuff. And uh, yeah, definitely interested in the stuff you've been doing. And I, I actually, I'm, I want to know more about this, the, the synth stuff. And, I, you know, I, I want to see where that develops because that's, that's something that I think would be a good fork of uh, uh, um, an interaction type in SP tools. Because the moment I can do like the corpus analysis, there's kind of static synthesis. And I do plan on doing that classification regression preset mapping, but uh, this idea of using live audio input to uh, control synthesis parameters in real time is uh, with uh, emphasis on how it, low latency onset stuff mm -hmm. is of, of keen interest. Yeah, for for me too. So no, let's definitely keep in touch. I'll let you know how things progress and maybe I can make a contribution to SB tools down the road. That would be awesome. All right. Well, thanks cool. so much for your time. Thanks for organizing this. It's uh, yeah, really good to chat with you.